Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Pettit, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lessons, you're going to be studying the doctrine found in Joseph Smith history, verses 27 through 65. It's my responsibility, privilege really, in Beyond Come Follow Me to tell you all the fun, uplifting, inspiring stories that surround the doctrine that you're going to be studying this week. So without further ado, here we go. Last week, I told you all about the miracles that led the Smith family to the Palmyra area. I told you the stories that happened leading up to the first vision, things that went on with the first vision, and a little bit of the history of what happened to Joseph and his family following the first vision. Now, this week, we're three years later. It's 1823. In fact, it's specifically September 21st, 1823. Joseph Smith is 17 years old, and he's concerned about his standing before the Lord. It's been three years, and he had pr been promised further light, further understanding, further communication, and it hadn't come. And so Joseph wanted to know his standing before God. He figured that it was his fault that the further communication hadn't come yet. He figured that maybe he had sinned or done something to offend his heavenly father. And so he came upstairs to his bedroom, this bedroom picture behind me, to pray and ask God for forgiveness so that he could have his place again as, as one who is called to, to restore the church. Now, it's important to note a couple of things about this home that you're seeing pictured behind me. One, it's not original. The wood just didn't last 200 years. But what the church did, and when they, decades after they bought the farm, they decided to build, rebuild the home, they had a great description of what the home looked like thanks to Lucy's journal and other records. They also knew the approximate location of where the home stood based on tax records and deed, land deeds and whatnot from the 1820s. But as they started to dig around in the location that they thought that this home was, they found the original foundation stones. So we have complete confidence that this home is rebuilt on the exact location. Now it's fun to think about when the sister missionaries will give you a tour of this home if you were ever to visit Palmyra. They'll tell you briefly, as I did, that the home's not original, and yet it's built on the same location. And so what they'll tell you is that the this, this space that we stand in is the original airspace, and meaning that this is the area, the air, the space where Moroni appeared to Joseph, and they had their interviews with each other on, in September 1823. So September 20, uh, 1823, Joseph retires and makes the prayer. He says that while he was engaged in prayer, that a conduit opened up to heaven. And he looks up and he can see out beyond the roof of, this, of his home, up into the heavens, and he sees a man descending. And the man descends and he comes and stands next to Joseph. His feet don't touch the floor. He's wearing the most exquisite white robe that Joseph has ever seen. And the man calls Joseph by name. He then identifies himself, introducing himself as Moroni, one being sent from the very presence of God. Now, I think for a moment, Joseph's got to be impressed with what he's seeing and hearing. He's praying, seeking an answer. An answer comes in the form of a conduit opening straight to heaven, a resurrected glorious being descending. The man doesn't touch the floor with his feet. He calls Joseph by name. And then the man says, I'm sent from the very presence of God. My name is Moroni. Joseph's got to be impressed with what he's seeing and hearing. And yet at the same time, I think of Moroni. Here's Moroni. He's descended with the assignment from the Lord to go and meet Joseph Smith and to teach him a lot of things. And we're going to get into those lots of things. But Moroni is standing here face to face with Joseph Smith, the chosen prophet of the restoration. Is Moroni unfamiliar with who Joseph is? Of course he's not. He knows exactly who this boy is. He knows that this boy has been chosen by the Lord to be the prophet of the restoration, to be an instrument in the hands of the Lord in restoring the fullness of the everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is he going to do all that, but parts of the things that he's going to do, 
he's going to go to the hill just two and a half miles down the road where Moroni 1500 years prior deposited the plates. Can you imagine how excited he must be to tell Joseph the plates I buried just down the road? We're going to go there together and you're going to get the plates and you're going to translate the plates. The record that my father abridged from all the holy prophets over a thousand years worth of history, it's there and you're going to be the one to translate it so that everybody in the world can read it. This is my dad's record. I added to the record. All the holy prophets had it. It contains the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moroni must have been excited. Moroni also knew that Joseph was going to be the one who the Lord would restore priesthood powers and authorities and temple ordinances to and through. Moroni understood that because of Joseph's prophetic calling, all of God's children, then living, to be living in the future, having lived in the past, everybody from Adam to the end of time will have the opportunity to hear, know, and understand and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And upon that acceptance, have temple ordinances performed under the direction of power and authority of the priesthood and thereby, for, and thereby qualifying to return to the presence of God. So with all of this understanding that Moroni has, Joseph Smith, the one who Isaiah prophesied about, who was talked about in the Book of Mormon, Mor Moroni standing there looking at, at Joseph. Joseph's got it, or Moroni's got to be pretty impressed with who he's seeing and talking to. So it makes me ask the rhetorical question: Who do you think, Moroni or Joseph? Who do you think's more impressed with who? Well, Moroni starts to talk to Joseph, and I told you two things. He says he calls him by name. I'm Moroni, sent from the presence of God. He then says to Joseph, God has called you to an important work. And because of that work, your name is going to be had for good and evil throughout the world. He then tells him, number four, in a nearby hill is deposited plates, whereupon is engraved the gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ as delivered by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent. And then points five and six, he spends the rest of the night on and that's the temple, and how to prepare for the second coming. So we get the brief introductions done. We, Joe, Moroni says, you're still called. You're going to do a great work. Some people are going to love you for it. Some people aren't going to like you for it, but you're going to do a great work. There's the introductions. They're out of the way. Now, let me tell you, Joseph, there's a book deposited in the nearby hill. contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, as delivered by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent. Almost kind of getting that out of the way. And now he spends the rest of the night talking about the temple and preparing for the second coming. And those are some of the verses that you're going to read in your Come, Follow Me lessons this week. It sounds a lot like what President Nelson keeps teaching all of us. Read the Book of Mormon, go to the temple, and prepare for the second coming. The very same message that Moroni is giving to Joseph. Now, Moroni delivers his message. He leaves. Leaves in the conduit out of heaven. The room becomes dark again. Joseph's laying on his bed. He's thinking, he's pondering about these things. He's trying to understand what he hears. Moroni gave him an opportunity to think. And then when sufficient time had passed, Moroni reappears and does it all over again. He goes through the whole recital of information, and then he withdraws himself. Joseph give, has an opportunity to think about this, probably pray about it, ponder on it. And then Moroni appears a third time. At the end of the third interview, as Joseph calls it, the rooster crows, the day is over, or the night is over, the day's beginning, and it's time to get to work. Well, Joseph hasn't slept a wink, but he gets out of bed, heads downstairs, has his breakfast, heads out the door to work in the farm with his dad and his brothers. Now, let me continue the story of Moroni's fourth visit once we're outside in the field where it actually took place. Here pictured behind me is the Smith family farm in Palmyra. Just over this way is the log home where I just was. Down this way, down the fence line just a little way is the frame home, the white frame home as they refer to it. And I'm gonna take you there a little bit later in this video. Behind me here is these trees, that's the sacred grove. Okay, so Joseph leaves his room in the morning. He goes downstairs, has breakfast, gets ready for the day, heads out the door with his brothers and his dad and comes out here to the farm and starts to work. 
And Joseph Sr. realizes that his son isn't working as hard as he usually does. He knows Joseph's not lazy, so Joseph Jr. must be sick. He tells Joseph Jr., why don't you head back to the home and rest? Joseph does just that. He's heading back towards the house. He has to cross a fence. He climbs up the fence to jump over it. His foot catches on the fence, and he falls flat on his face. He was just too tired to make the attempt over the fence. He's laying face down on the ground, and he hears his name being called, Joseph. Joseph. He turns over, and he sees the one calling his name is the angel Moroni. The angel Moroni, in somewhat of a scolding fashion, asks Joseph why he did not tell his father, as the angel Moroni commanded him to do, tell his father about the previous night's visits. And Joseph admits to the angel Moroni, he says, I don't think my dad will believe me. The angel Moroni, with encouragement, says, no, Joseph, your father will believe you. Go and tell your father what's happened in the previous night. So Joseph crosses back over the fence. He approaches his dad, and he says, dad, I'm not, you know, I'm making this up, but it's essentially this. He says, dad, I'm not sick. I'm just tired. I was awake all night. Let me tell you why I was awake. Joseph Jr. rehearses to his dad everything that the angel Moroni had done, some of the things that he could remember that the angel Moroni had said. His father listened patiently. And finally, when Joseph Jr. had concluded his rehearsal of what had happened the previous night, Joseph Sr.'s response was very simple, yet very direct. He says to his son, it is of God. Go and do as commanded by the messenger. I'm sure that that testimony, those words of Joseph Sr. is the first testimony born in this dispensation of Joseph Jr.'s prophetic calling. Joseph Sr. believed him. So what was the commandment that Joseph Sr. was referring to that the messenger had, had given to Joseph? To go to the hill. Remember, in the previous night in his bedroom, he saw in vision exactly where the place were located. So he doesn't go home. He leaves the farm. He walks a mere two and a half miles down the road to the hill where the plates were buried. Now, let me take you to the top of the hill. Pictured here behind me is the Hill Camorra. I'm standing at the base of the hill. Now, if you were to climb the Hill Camorra, you would find out that it is way steeper and way bigger than you could ever imagine. No painting does it justice as to how steep this hill is. But after making the climb up the hill, Joseph says, owing to the distinctness of the vision I saw, I knew exactly where the plates were. Now, according to Oliver Cowdery, he said that the plates were buried a little south of the north end of the hill on the western side, not far from the top. Joseph sees the rock, just as he had seen in vision the night before. And he, it, he says it's rounding in the middle. It's thin towards the edges. There's lots of dirt built up around the sides. He clears off the dirt. Then he finds a lever, probably a large stick. He gets that stick underneath the rock like a seesaw. He pries, pushes it down, pries the uh, rock up, and pushes it aside. And there he's looking in, and there's a box made out of stone and cement. And in that box are the plates. Joseph reaches in for the plates, and he gets shocked. Joseph reaches in a second time, and he gets a bigger shock. Joseph, he's a tough guy, and he decides he's really going to give it all he can to get those plates out. He reaches in for the plates, and this third time gets shocked so hard that it throws him onto his back. And he screams out, why can I not obtain the plates? And it was at that point that Moroni appeared, and he said, it's because you've not been obedient in keeping the commands of the Lord. Now, what commandment had he not been keeping faithful to? Joseph would later admit in his history that for a moment, even if it was just a split second moment, when he saw the plates, he thought, this could get my parents out of the financial distress that they're in. Now, I don't think he entertained that thought, but he had that thought cross his mind even for a split second. And because of that, Joseph wasn't ready. Moroni teaches him. He tutors the prophet Joseph. Every time Joseph would come to the hill, it was a tutoring session. He, Moroni was teaching and preparing Joseph how to be a prophet. Well, he couldn't take the plates home that year. 
He heads home, uh, certainly disappointed. He gathers up the family and he tells the whole family, not just dad now, but now mom's there and all the siblings are there. And he tells them of the experience that he had with the angel Moroni the previous night and the experience that he just had at the hill. The plates were still in the hill. He didn't bring them home, of course. I told you previously that his brothers and maybe even his sisters were all there in that room, or at least that area where the angel Moroni appeared. So how did the family respond to Joseph telling these stories? Here, it would have been very easy for one of the brothers to say, yeah, right, I was in the room with you. I didn't see the light. I didn't hear this voice from somebody sent from the presence of God. No, none of that. They all believed him. They all trusted him completely. Joseph was such a high character that if Joseph said it was true, they all believed him. If that's what Joseph says, then that's what happened. So certain were, there, were, there, were the family members that 45 days later, the oldest brother, Alvin, would be on his deathbed. And he would say to Joseph this, do everything in your power to obtain the, in being obedient to the commandments given you and do everything in your power to obtain the record. On his deathbed, Alvin testified that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that the Book of Mormon was true, yet the Book of Mormon was still in the hill pictured behind me. They understood that Joseph was, was a true, faithful boy and they had no doubt what they were hearing from uh, from their younger brother and older brother, depending on the, on the sibling. So in 18, this is 1823, 1824, September 1824, Joseph returns to the hill. He's commanded to return annually on the annual anniversary date in September. Now it's 1824. He opens up the box again, or moves the stone, looks inside the box. This time he reaches in for the plates, and this time he doesn't get shocked. He actually pulls the plates out. He puts the plates on the ground next to him and reaches in for the next artifact. And what else was in the box? The Urim and Thummim, right? So he reaches in to grab and pull out the Urim and Thummim. And as he does so, he turns to where the plates were and the plates are gone. Plates have disappeared. Moroni is not there, but the plates aren't either. Joseph's frantically looking under bushes, behind trees, everywhere he can. I don't know how long Moroni made him suffer, with the thought that he lost the plates before even getting them. But eventually Moroni appears and he he's again scolds Joseph. You have not been obedient in keeping the commandments of the Lord. What was the commandment? To keep the plates safe. He had let the plates out of his sight even just for a moment. And that moment was too long. He, could, he was not prepared to take the plates home that year either. Joseph was learning some hard lessons here. But it continued. In 1825, Joseph returns to the hill. Nothing's recorded of what happens, but we know that he didn't get the plates. Between this visit and the next, Joseph would be hired by an individual by the name of Josiah Stoll. Josiah Stoll lived in Colesville, New York, and Joseph and Joseph Sr. were hired by Josiah Stoll to come and work for him. Now, the Smiths, they took any odd job they could. They were just trying to make ends meet, keep food on the table, and make the, the farm the payment on the farm. They were doing everything they could to do that, working any odd job they could. As a side note, this is how Joseph met Martin Harris. Martin Harris needed a couple of wells dug on his property, and the Smith boys were known as the best well diggers in the area. So he hires Joseph and Hiram and Joseph Sr. to come and dig a couple of wells. That's how Joseph Jr. and Martin Harris become acquainted with each other. So, but that, that comes later. He's with Josiah Stoll. Josiah Stoll gets this great idea. I, I say great meaning big idea. It's not a good idea. But it's, a, it's this big idea from some of the research that he did that apparently some of the Spanish, Span, uh, some of the Spanish explorers from way back when had deposited some treasure, some gold treasure in the hills in Pennsylvania. So Josiah Stoll says, well, I need a team to come and help me look for the treasure. And if we get the treasure, we're gonna split it. So, but if we don't get the treasure, I'm still gonna pay you some money. So it is an employed job. So Joseph Jr., Joseph Sr., they head down there for the, for the paycheck. 
they're walking around the hills of Pennsylvania, and it was Joseph who finally convinced Josiah Stoll, there's no treasure up here. You know, give it up. This is, this is fruitless. We're headed back to Palmyra. But while he was down there with Josiah Stoll, he was working uh, uh, for Josiah, but part of the employment agreement is that he would room and board with a Mr. Isaac Hale, who was residing in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Colesville, New York, Harmony, Pennsylvania, they, they sit right next to each other, just the border between the New York and Pennsylvania states goes right between those two little towns. So he rooms and boards with a Mr. Isaac Hale in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And while he's rooming and boarding them with the Hells, he meets Isaac's oldest daughter, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful Emma. They fall in love with each other. They court each other. They do, they have as much of a relationship as they can under the circumstances. Joseph returns to the hill in September 1826, and he asks Moroni, when will I be able to obtain the plates? Moroni replies, if you return one year from now with the right person, you will be permitted to take the plates. If not, you will be cut off and you'll never obtain the plates. So now the pressure's on Joseph. He's been working and training to become a prophet, trying to be obedient to the commandments of the Lord, doing the best he can, and uh, he's got one more chance. But it's not just up to Joseph now. He now has to bring the right person. He doesn't know who that person is. He goes back to work, doing, doing the farming and everything else that, that occupies his daily life. With this heavily weighing down on him, who is the right person? It's revealed to Joseph that the woman he's in love with, Emma, is the right person to bring to this hill with him in September 1827. In January 1827, nine months before the final visit to the hill, Joseph uh, uh, marries Emma. Now, Joseph's, or excuse me, Emma's father did not like this relationship. He'd heard the stories of angels and, and the things that Joseph was doing. He didn't believe Joseph, uh, the testimony of Joseph. And so he said to Emma, you're not getting married in my house. You know, this isn't happening. Uh, so Joseph and Emma eloped and they got married and then moved in with Joseph's parents at the Smith family farm here in New York. Well, on the, on the night of September 21st, 1827, we get the account from Lucy, Joseph's mother. And it goes like this. She says that about midnight, she was still up working there in the kitchen area. And Joseph comes down the stairs from the upstairs bedroom. Doesn't say a word to his mother, but heads out the front door, hooking up the horse and wagon. She doesn't think anything of it until she sees Emma descend the stairs, walk through the kitchen area without saying a word to her, her mother-in-law, heads out the front door, she gets in the carriage and the two of them head out into the midnight dark night. She said at that point, she knew what was happening. They were going to the hill for the plates and they did just that. And Joseph came here to the hill on that night uh, after midnight and he ascended the hill he pulled back the rock, reached into the box, no shock. He kept them in his hands. He didn't let them out of his sight. He put the rock back, headed down the hill, got into the carriage, and they left together from the hill with plates in hand. Now I think, why did Joseph need to bring someone? And why did he have to be Emma? We know the commandment. You can have the plates if you bring the right person. I just told you, Joseph has the plates. Therefore, it means that Emma was the right person. And I asked myself those questions again. Why did he need somebody and why Emma? Well, the, one of the reasons I love church history so much is because it's so relatable. Nephi says, let's liken the scriptures to ourselves. I say, let's liken church history to ourselves. If we can find these wonderful, faith-promoting, inspiring, uplifting stories from individuals who had a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, perhaps we, as members of the church with the testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, can experience the same uplifting, inspiring, wonderful experiences that they did. But aside from all that, and that's why I love church history, is I can relate to Joseph and Emma's situation. No, I've never ascended a hill in mid at midnight. And I'm, 
of course, I've never taken plates out of a hill. But how do I find myself in this story? Because Joseph has been called to a church calling. I've had a lot of church callings, various different church callings. But there is no church calling that I've ever had in which I have sacrificed for, in which my sacrifice for that church calling has been greater than the sacrifice my wife has given so that I can serve in that calling. So in other words, whenever I'm off doing a church calling, my wife is sacrificing more than I am so I can serve in my church calling. And in a lot of respects, that's how it was with Joseph and Emma. They left the hill, husband and wife, side by side, moving forward together in the work of the Lord. Emma would be there for every heartache, every disappointment, every struggle, every trial that Joseph would go through. Joseph suffered. Emma suffered equally. And in some regards, Emma suffered greater than Joseph. I'm anxious to tell you stories about Emma to prove the testimony that I have of her calling. And so it was. Joseph and Emma together had the plates, and now they're moving from the hill forward together in the work of the Lord. Now, the first thing that Joseph had to do was protect the plates, keep them safe. He'd have to work on keeping them safe before he even started the translation work. So let's go back to the Smith family farm. We'll go to the white frame home now. I'll show you around there in some of the hiding places that Joseph put the plates to keep them safe and secure. Pictured here behind me is the Smith family frame home. It was here that the Smiths lived from the years 1825 to 1829. This home is original. They say that about 80% of this home is original. It was from here that Joseph would depart every September to meet the angel Moroni at the hill. It was here where Joseph brought his new, new bride, Emma, where they first lived together with Joseph's family. And it was here where our story picks up. Joseph and Emma left this house for the hill, September 1827. They returned here sometime after breakfast. So they were gone six or seven, eight hours, perhaps. They didn't bring the plates back to the house that morning. On their way home from the hill, and from the hill, the hill to this home is only about two and a half miles. Somewhere in between these, the two locations, Joseph and Emma went into the woods and they found a, a hollowed out, fallen down tree. Joseph took a knife and cut the bark of that tree, three sides to make a flap, pulls back the bark, slides the plates into the hollowed out log, puts the flap back down. Now the plates are safe and hidden. They return back to the home, of course, without the plates. It wouldn't take Joseph long before he felt that he needed the place to be in a safer spot. So he went to retrieve the plates one night, late at night, under the cloak of darkness. And he finds the, his, the hiding spot, pulls back the flap, reaches in, pulls the plates out, and he's heading back home. Now, remind you, this makes the story cool to think that the plates weighed 50 pounds. You think a 50 pounds bag of flour or a bag of dry cement, okay? It's, it's heavy, and he's walking along, and he gets attacked from behind. Well, he, he wrestles the guy off of his back, and now he starts running, knowing that he's under attack. He starts running for this house. A second assailant approaches Joseph, or excuse me, doesn't approach me. He comes from behind and hits him with the back end of a gun into his head. It puts Joseph on the floor, onto the ground. Joseph grabs the plates, stands up, and he starts running again. Remember, 50 pounds of plates. This time, the third assailant approaches Joseph from the front. Joseph's moving at full speed. His adrenaline's high. He brings back his fist, and he hits the guy just as hard as he can, and he continues to run. When he gets home, he gets within the safe confines of the house. His family rushes to see him, make sure he's okay. And as he's visiting with his family about what just happened, he realizes that his thumb is dislocated. He hit that guy so hard. He asks his dad to pop that thumb back in place. Well, the plates are back here at this house. Now Joseph needs to continue to keep them safe. One of the hiding places that Joseph put them in, or one of the places that Joseph put the plates was in a cooper shop. Now, Joseph Sr. was a cooper. A cooper is somebody who makes barrels, wooden barrels. And so out there in the shop where all the tools and all the wood are, 
Joseph goes and he lifts up a floorboard and he puts the plates in the floorboard, puts the floorboard down and re returns to the house. Joseph gets an impression of some time later, a few days later, that the plates aren't safe. Joseph goes out, pulls back the floorboard, lifts up the plates and puts the plates in the overhead loft of the cooper shop. Not long after that, a mob of angry men come down the road. They're looking for the plates. They get the idea that maybe the plates are in the cooper shop. They go in, they take all the tools and the barrels and the wood and they throw it all out into the street. They ransack the whole shop looking for the plates. They take their axes and beat the floorboards to look under the floorboards as they thought maybe that's a good hiding spot for these plates. They looked everywhere except just above their heads in that loft where the plates were safe. Joseph moved the plates again, this time inside the house. He removed the, the bricks of the fireplace, pulled them up, dug a hole, put the plates in, put the dirt back on top, put the bricks on top of the plates. And they sat underneath the, the fireplace for a time. Joseph would remove them and, and make other arrangements. This, or as they were exposed, Joseph uh, heard of a mob that was approaching the house. Joseph decided that he needed to hide the plates. So obviously again, he told his younger sisters, get in the bed and pretend you're asleep. The girls get in bed, they throw the blanket over the girls and Joseph slides the plates between the two girls. The two girls are sleeping there, there's the plates or they're pretending to sleep and there's the plates. The men come in, they ransack the house, they look everywhere in every cupboard under every bed, they do, they, they look everywhere they can except in the bed where the girls are. Even though these guys were, were thugs, they were mobsters, they were evil people, they at least had the decency not to disturb two sleeping girls. So the plates stayed safe there between the two girls. Now, things were starting to get a little crazy. A lot of threats against the Smith, Smith family. Everybody, they, here's the irony, they didn't believe that Joseph had the plates, yet they kept coming and terrorizing the family in hopes of finding the plates. I, I guess to just in case Joseph was telling the truth. Well, either way, the threats and the mobs weren't slowing down. So Joseph knew that he had to get out of town to keep the plates safe. They didn't know where to go. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any friends or family outside of Palmyra, except for Emma's family, who was down in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Emma writes a letter to, his, to her dad. I don't know the contents of the letter, but it must have included things like this. Father, I know you don't like Joseph. I know that you don't like that I got married to Joseph, but we're in danger up here and we need a place to stay. Can we move in with you? Isaac Hell, the father of Emma, replied um, and said, yes, come to Harmony. Now, fortunately, Isaac and Joseph had one thing in common, and it was probably only one thing, but the one thing they had in common was their mutual love for Emma. So of course, Emma's father says, yes, come down here. You can be safe. You can live in our home. They were in the home for three or four months before Joseph negotiated the purchasing the adjoining farm or part of the farm from Isaac. And he secured the 13 acres. They're now adjoining Isaac's uh, acreage, uh, uh, Isaac's farm. And that is the place where Emma and Joseph would live while they were in harmony. Now, I'll tell you all the harmony stories once we get to those Come Follow Me lessons that have to do with the revelations that took place in harmony. But to finish off the verses that you're reading out of the Joseph Smith history, it talks a lot about Martin Harris. I told you briefly how Martin and Joseph became acquainted. Martin had a testimony that what Joseph was doing was true. And he wanted to be a part of it. And he, he found himself in a fortunate situation where he could be a part of it because of his financial resources. When leaving this home for Harmony, Martin gave him $50, which is a lot of money in those days. The $50 was to go towards the work Joseph had been called to do. Whatever Joseph needed, there was the financial support for Martin. Well, Martin goes down to visit Joseph and Emma to inquire how he can be a part in supporting the work. While he was there, Joseph decides to write down some characters from the Book of Mormon, from the plates, the characters that were engraved on the plates. And we have a copy 
of that original script of paper that Joseph used. The original piece of paper that Joseph wrote down these characters on is owned by the community of Christ, the church that was once known as the reorganized church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is a copy of that original document, which they have in their museum today. And it's those characters that Joseph wrote down, copying them from the plates. He gives this piece of paper to Martin Harris and Mar because Martin wants to take him into New York City, where all the smart people apparently are, and have an inquire about this being a true translation or do these characters look like they are authentic. He wanted to kind of have some evidence or proof of the testimony that what Joseph was doing was, was real. So he goes and finds a man by the name of Charles Anthon. Charles Anthon is the expert on ancient languages. Uh, not only uh, was he teaching at Columbia College the language of, of, of Greek and Latin, but he was also very familiar with antique languages uh, as well. And so uh, he sought out Charles Anthon. He said, hey, I've got these characters. They're of ancient date. Charles Anthon was very interested. He takes a look at, at, at the original copy of the characters, the picture that I just showed to you. And Charles Anthon, he tells them that they are true characters of ancient date, originating in the Egyptian language. And he and um, uh, Martin Harris requests a certificate of authenticity, or at least just a, 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 a statement from Charles saying, yes, this, these look like these are true characters and the, and the translation is accurate. And he wanted that certificate so that he could take it back to the people in Palmyra and say, see, look at this, look, look at this certificate that I've received from Charles Anthon. See, the work is true. Of course, that's not the way the Lord works, but that's what was Martin's hope. Martin obtains that certificate. Charles Anthon says, hey, why don't you bring the plates to me and I'll do the work. I'll translate all of them for you. And, um, uh, Martin Harris says, well, no, that's not the way that it's working. This man by the name of Joseph Smith, he's been called of God to do the work. Charles N. says, called of God? What, what's the story here? So Martin Harris recites to him the story of how Joseph obtained the plates, how he found the plates, being led there by the angel Moroni. Charles Anthon requests the certificate. He says, let me see that certificate for a minute. Martin Harris hands it to him and he tears it up. He says, there's no such thing as angels today. He says, but if you'll bring it, the plates to me, I'll still make, I, my offer is still there. I'll translate the plates for you. And uh, Martin says, I, well, I can't bring the plates to you. And even if I could, a portion of it is sealed. And Charles Hanton, he's like, this is crazy. He says, I can't read a sealed book. That's literally, literally what he said. Well, Martin returns stronger in his testimony because of the evidence that he had had, but without the certificate. Now, I want to take you to, I want to cross-reference this to 2 Nephi 27. And what Nephi is doing in 2 Nephi 27 is he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. So we've got the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Nephi recording this. And here's how it goes in verse 15. Verse uh, chapter 27 of 2 Nephi. But behold, it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall say unto him to whom he shall deliver the book, the book being the plates. So the Lord's going to talk to the person he delivered the place to. Who's that? Joseph. So behold, it shall come to pass that the Lord shall say unto him, meaning Joseph, take these words which are not sealed and deliver them to another that he may show them unto the learned saying, read this. So in other words, Isaiah and Nephi are prophesying that the Lord is going to give Joseph permission to make this document and send it with Martin Harris to go to the learned people in New York and hand him the document and say, read this. And that's just what Martin did with Charles Anthon. And then it continues, read this, I pray thee, and the learned shall saying, bring hither the book, and I will read them. Didn't I tell you that's part of church history? Charles Anthon said, bring the book to me. I'll take a look at that. And now because of the glory of the world and to get gain, will they say this? Well, of course, that's what Charles Anthon was going to do. And I don't blame him because he 
he didn't have a testimony of it, but he saw an opportunity here where he's got an antique record and he's going to translate it and publish it just as he did dozens and dozens of other books. And so he's looking, he, he's going to take glory of the world rather than doing it for the glory of God. And the man shall say, meaning Martin Harris, I cannot bring the book for it is sealed. Didn't I tell you that was part of the history? And then in 18, and then shall the learned, meaning Charles Anthon, say, well, then I cannot read it. And Nephi, quoting Isaiah, continues on. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that the Lord God will deliver again the book and the words thereof to him that is not learned. In other words, we're going to go back to jo Charles Anthony isn't going to be the translator. It's going to be Joseph Smith, just the way that it was going to be the whole time. And the man that is not learned, so Joseph Smith is going to say, I am not learned. I've got a third grade edge. Can you, here's the, here's the plates. Joseph, of course, can't, can't read it. He doesn't recognize it as anything other than scratching on metal plates. And he's got a third grade education. Emma Smith, later in life, when pressed about her testimony of the Book of Mormon, would say that Joseph wasn't learning it enough to even dictate a well-worded letter, let alone translate a record. And so here's Joseph, who struggles in, in, in speech at this point in his life, having a hard time reading and writing at this point in his life. He says, well, I can't be the translator. You expect me to be the translator? I'm not learned. And how does the Lord respond? And then shall the Lord God say unto him, unto Joseph, the learned shall not read them, for they have rejected them, and I am able to do mine own work. Wherefore, thou shalt read the words which I shall give unto thee. Joseph, you're going to be the translator. I know your weaknesses. I know your shortcomings. But Joseph, remember, this isn't your work. The Lord says, this is my work. You take the book. You take the plates. And just read the words that I give you. In other words, Joseph... I'm going to do all the work. You just be the instrument in my hands to make it happen. Now, how do we liken this to ourselves? Easily. Don't we have church callings and responsibilities and even worldly pursuits, any, any righteous worldly pursuits, anything that we're doing that we're trying to do well, and we feel like we have a weakness, we have a shortcoming. But particularly in our church responsibilities, sometimes we're called to do things that we don't think we can do. We can't step up and make sure that that happens, or perhaps somebody else could do it better than us. And here's the Lord reminding us through Isaiah, through, ne through Nephi, and now through this church history story, this is my work, the Lord says, and I'll be able to get it accomplished. He's also revealing, in part, how this translation process is going to work. He says, all you got to do is read it. I'm going to give you the words and you just read it, and we'll worry about a scribe later. That'll come later. But he's reassuring Joseph, it's okay. I understand your weaknesses. I understand your shortcomings, and that's not going to stop my work from going forward. I'm not worried about it, Joseph, so don't you be a worried, worried about it either. Let's move forward on this thing together. And those are the verses that you're reading today. Those are the, this week, those are the testimonies or the, the stories and the testimonies surrounding the, the verses that you're studying in your Come Follow Me lessons this week. I love these stories. Now, from here, Joseph is, leaves Harmony, or leaves Palmyra, goes to Harmony. I've given you a brief introduction into Harmony. As we look in forward to next week and the revelations that were received in Harmony, I'll give you the whole story of Harmony, how exactly he got there, all the wonderful things that took place in Harmony. So stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, I am glad uh, to have been with you and shared my testimony and love of the gospel with you. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.